and welcome to Joy News Prime, live from our studio here in Accra. We're live on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 125, and around the world on myjoyonline.com. Coming up tonight, we might be creeping towards some dark doom. So, as a document from the Ghana Great Company makes a sore revelation, we have details of that memo that warns of likely collapse of the energy sector. Now, also coming up, Chairman of Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament tears into his ranking member, accusing him of throwing tantrums over increase in passport application prices, despite what he describes as justifiable reasons given for the hike. But with the NDC minority complaining about the cost, is the Foreign Affairs Ministry willing to review the fees? Later on, we'll tell you the story of a boy whose dream of becoming a medical doctor is unable to afford further education due to a brain tumor condition. Well, let's start off uh, from the passport office. Tonight, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament, Andy Apiakubi, is clashing with his ranking member over the recently announced hike in passport application fees. Andy Apiakubi describes the concerns raised by Samuel Okujutua Blackwell regarding the hike in fees as tantrums. Now, the minority spokesperson on foreign affairs told Joy News while he was not opposed to the increase in fees in principle, he was not in support of the magnitude of increase. For anybody to step out to say that they... Uh, ...not uh, bode well for our country, the timing is bad. We have uh, unprecedented economic crisis. Uh, inflation has gone through the roof. Um, uh, you know that the general living conditions are terrible. We have a cost of living crisis. This cannot be the time uh, to do this. So we, we made our views uh, very, very clear. Uh, to them. Uh, what happened subsequently is that uh, they uh, went ahead and this um, uh, was added to the general fees and charges. Uh, but we insisted that even if this is where they want to get to, it could be done in a graduated manner. Uh, because what the foreign minister admitted is that uh, they had not touched the uh, passport fees for a long time, for many years. So I said that, look, you, you don't um, virtually uh, derelict for this long, and then suddenly you wake up, say that uh, it is the lowest in the sub-region, and so you want to slap such a high percentage. And so let it be graduated. That was the advice we had for them. That is why we suggested that let it be graduated, because if you look at other countries uh, who left us behind, it was being done gradually, and they didn't even achieve that increment during periods of economic crisis. Not when we are going through financial haircuts, we are desperate for an IMF bailout and all of that. So I am deeply disappointed that the ministry did not take our advice and has just done one full swoop at a go, just imposing this high increment yeah, but, on, but the, on, on, on the suffering but, 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 but this it, was it, subject it, it, it to parliamentary up. this was subject to parliamentary approval is there any possibly any last minute intervention that might come through from your office or perhaps the minority side on the foreign affairs Committee? when when the house resumes we intend to revisit this matter because uh, my recommendation I believe that is sound uh, our uh, committee was clear that this should not be done uh, in one uh, single swoop, and that uh, it should be a graduated uh, approach. So uh, it's a matter we will revisit. We will uh, uh, summon the uh, ministers and officials from the ministry and see what, what can be done, because this, this, this is really, really, really uh, terrible, and it's, 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 it's going to add on to the already... Um, excruciating hardship right. and, and anguish that Ghanaians are going through. But reacting to these comments at a news conference earlier today, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Andy Apiakubi, argued that Okujota Blackwell's stance was without basis 
as the decision to approve the proposed fees was unanimous in the NDC-led subsidiary legislation committee. For anybody to step out to say that they vehemently opposed the review of the fee is uh, neither here nor there. Uh, the person who is throwing those tantrums is not a member of that committee. And indeed, it was not the work of the Foreign Affairs Committee, which I chair, which he is a ranking. So this is the work of the Subsidiary Legislation Committee, and indeed chaired by the I, uh, NDC uh, Member of Parliament. So it never occurred in the committee meeting that there was protestation as to the uh, recommendation for review. So it was a unanimous decision taken by the committee. It is amazing uh, how Ghanaians want us to be political all the time. And that people are saying it is election year and therefore we don't have to. It is election year. Let us not forget that it is your money. It is your own money that could otherwise give you something else for the benefit of the whole rather than for the benefit of only a segment of society. So although it is um, election year, it is important for us to be prudent in the use of public resources. Again, the same people who complain of the increase are the same people who are buying tickets for use uh, every now and again as they travel. And they are paying $2,000 plus for one trip. They, you cannot travel without the passport, even though you may have the money to pay for the 2000 plus dollars. So the best document that gives you the opportunity to travel is only 500 Ghana cities. And the APA Kubi also revealed that the proposed hike was 700 cities for a normal 32 page booklet application. But the Committee on Subsidiary Legislation fought to have it reviewed to 500 cities. At the Ministry of Finance, there was an agreement that they should charge something like 700 Ghana cities for the normal. And they came to Parliament with this proposal of 700 cities. And they, when the referral was made to our committee, and they not a committee for foreign affairs, but a committee for subsidiary legislation, where I have only just exited as a, a ranking member. And I still remain as a member there. So at the committee of subsidiary legislation, we agreed to reduce it from 700 to 500. And indeed, it was based on the submission of the ministry that one passport co cost 400 Ghana cities. And uh, we expected some administrative cost of about 100. So we agreed that this is not an avenue to make profits. But let us make sure that we cover all associated costs. That is, the cost of the booklet and the printing and the cost of the administrative uh, service. Let me hereby emphasize that at the said committee meeting, uh, all of us as members of the committee agreed to this proposition and this position uh, rec and recommended to the ministry to implement uh, the fee of 500 cities. Not one person uh, opposed it. And I want to also emphasize that this committee is chaired by a member of parliament from the minority and the vice chairman is also from the minority. Now, a document from the Ghana Grid Company has revealed that current erratic power outages being experienced in part of the country is as a result of shortfall in power generation. The document shows that a number of power plants are down as a result of fault Inadequate fuel and lack of maintenance, the energy, energy ministry and government spokesperson have consistently rebutted expert views that have attributed the outages to shortfall in generation by aggressively attributing same to localized maintenance. But a report from Gridco cited by Joy News shows that the erratic power supply, popularly known as Dumso, is due to shortfall in generation. Our, our in-house data analyst, Kofi Ajay, joins me in studio with analysis of the content of the document and more. Kofi, so we've looked at this document yeah. in its entirety. First off, what prediction does this document make? So let's start with the prediction that was made by the Ghana Energy Commission in December 2023. 
and they said two things going mm. to cause possible possible cause of doom so in 2024 mm -hmm. in the energy outlook that they put out mm -hmm. first one uh, was the fuel supply challenges mm -hmm. and we have the second one plant maintenance and mm -hmm. the reason why we are bringing mm -hmm. this prediction uh, is because the current report that the grid co actually mm -hmm. gave to parliament energy commission actually cites these mm -hmm. two um, you know uh, mm -hmm. source as, a, as as the source of mm -hmm. the current doom so that okay we so, so these were the predictions from yeah. the energy commission, commission. okay uh -huh. So now let's let's go to the, the next slide where the Energy Commission talks mm. about okay. cost mm. and fuel is the main factor here. Mm -hmm. According to their projection mm. or their energy outlook for 2024, we need about $1.2 billion to be able to buy natural gas to generate power for this country. And could you, you know for that 2024? For 2024. And this included... I mean, the local gas we mm -hmm. do have from Ghana Gas. Absolutely. It's included uh, in 1.2 billion, billion is mm -hmm. the total amount that we need to okay. purchase gas. Mm -hmm. And this is because if you look at the national grid, more than 65% comes from thermal generation. So mm -hmm. it means that fuel supply is really, really important. Now, mm -hmm. let's go through the grid code report mm -hmm. that we cited. Mm -hmm. So what's in that report? We, we are breaking it down for you. So mm -hmm. we have the total installed capacity for Ghana pegged at 5,620 5, megawatts. That's huge. That's huge. Mm -hmm. But this is installed capacity. Mm -hmm. Installed capacity needs to be what? To be Power. available. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Available capacity as of March 26th, mm -hmm. this is very recent data, 3,251. If you do a simple math, Kojo, mm -hmm. that leaves a deficit of 2,375 um, you know, available capacity that has not been mm. used at the moment mm. or has not been utilized mm. from the installed capacity of 5,622. Mm. Now, let's go further deep into the, the outlet or what Gridco actually put mm. out. The same thing. Mm -hmm. Maintenance, inadequate fuel supply, and Both. they add one more thing, faults, mm. or causing power not to be available, and this is estimated at 1,455 megawatt. megawatt. This is like That's twice of Kumasi or the Ashanti region combined. Mm. That's the kind of magnitude that we are talking about. Mm. And this explains why we are having the current erratic power supply. Mm. Now, let's, let's break this down. Maintenance costs alone could you account for 740 megawatts of the current shortage. So in terms of the plants mm. that we have, I mean, those that are down due to maintenance, mm -hmm. the power they should have given us is 740, 740 megawatts, megawatt. which we are not having now. Absolutely. And this, I think, is close to how much power would need to power even Western region, mm -hmm. in Western and Central. Absolutely. But if you, you have that out, that's, that, that's quite huge. Not just maintenance, mm -hmm. but we also have inadequate fuel supply, which, mm -hmm. is, which is a very key component mm -hmm. here. 595, you know, uh, megawatts. Megawatt. Not available because we do not have the needed fuel okay. to actually do the production. Mm. Faults, 120 uh, megawatts. Megawatt. If mm. you add all of them, 1,455 mm. megawatts, that is very huge, mm. Mm. currently not available. Let's mm. go a further deep into the findings. And mm. this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. If you look at the units unavailable due to maintenance, mm. you break it down, and the sources, Bui is one of them, the mm. twin power plant, and Mary, the Simmons unit, the Tico unit one, mm. all of them, we said it, 740. megawatts. Let's, let's go to the ones due to inadequate fuel. There's mm. the mm. Senate, there's a Sogli mm -hmm. phase one, there's KTPP unit, and there's AXA unit, all around 595. You know, and let's, see, let's look at the last one, which is the fault, which is Tico unit three, uh, 120 megawatts. Mm. Let's, let's also look at other ones. Now, if you look at the thermal generation mm. and the available fuel, mm. this is very shocking, Kojo. If you look at Takrade Thermal, mm. the available fuel can only last for 13 days. Mm. 13 days. So, so in, in, mm. in the Takrade Thermal area, the fuel we have now mm -hmm. can last for 13 days. 13 days. Mm. Thermal and and thermal. let's put this in context. Yeah. This was a report they did for the 27th of March to mm -hmm. the 2nd of April, Recent, which was then yesterday, yeah. you know. Very and, recent. and when they were saying that, they said the fuel we had could last us for 13 days. Mm -hmm. So let's say 20, 25th of March to 2nd, 
which was how many days? Let's say five days. Yeah. So it means that we're left with so six days of fuel. If nothing changes, close to half mm, okay. of the available fuel. Mm. When, and if nothing changes, holding all other factors constant, mm -hmm. we could be plunging ourselves in a very, very difficult situation. Mm. And you see the rest over there. There are some, some of the plans that currently, mm -hmm. they don't even have fuel. They are soggy plant and the same power. All of them currently uh, do not have fuel. So let's look at other thermal plants you know, in their locations, you will see some are even two, two days, days, some yeah. are zero, the corn thermal plant, and then also the access, also mm. zero as well. I think this will be the last one, and these ones, mm. we need to take a critical look at them. And I want to read verbatim. It says, marching our generation issues to our demands, 380 megawatts will have to be shared during normal times. Mm. And so during normal times, it is estimated that the average power that we have to share mm. is 380 megawatt that's mm. very significant mm. and at peak times we need to share 505 megawatts and mm. so at every point in time depending mm. on the prevailing circumstance mm. it depends on mm. what uh, you know ECG or grid co will decide to share so so the main question or one mm. of the important questions we need to ask in this circumstance is when will this end, end. It, even people in the power yes. sector don't even know yes. when it will end. Yes, I mean, you have some of the plants, not that they are not available, they are available, but the only problem now is they don't have fuel. Okay. So baseline, the biggest problem mm. is fuel. So make the fuel available yeah. and the plant will start producing. Mm. But another key component mm. is the fact that yesterday we had the chairman of the energy com uh, committee to, mm. in parliament saying that the president has given a directive that they should halt um, you know, uh, the exportation of power. Mm. But Gridco says that they are, they, are looking at, they are looking at things and if the demand or the peak load increases, they may have to cut mm. the power that we export as a country mm. by 40% mm. and utilize other mm. internal means mm. to also share the load. Okay. This means that if you cut 40% of your export, you are going to lose the forex yeah. that you need to bring in. Exactly. Now, just as we're speaking, we're still picking information from our sources mm. in the sector. Now, we're told that we have a deficit between 600 mm -hmm. to 700 megawatts as we speak. Now, there is no fuel. Yeah. Now, the daily gas or fuel need is between 450 mm scarf and above. Yeah. Currently, Sankofa Jubilee 10 and from our own oil field estimated a 335 mm scarf. Mm -hmm. So, we're a deficit of 100 mm, mm scarf. Supply from WAPCO, about 55 mm scarf. Total gas volumes available to Ghana, including Nigeria gas, is 390 mm scarf. So it means that Basically. whatever it is, we still have yeah. deficit in yeah. fuel. Uh, very interesting days. But like, as we said, the question is, when will this end? It's a question that the energy ministry another, need yeah, to answer. Another question is, mm. at this moment, do we have what it takes to raise $1.2 billion mm. to buy fuel? Well, <laughs> let's see. Collect more. Uh, anyway, so that's Kofi J giving us uh, all of those details there. Uh, away from that, Chow News can authoritatively report that a police inspector accused of using a service rifle to kill his girlfriend at a doom in Kumasi is alive and healthy. Social media reports have alleged the death of Inspector Ahmed Chumesi, also known as Tycoon, who has been on prison remand since his arrest last year. But Ohim Interior of our security desk, who was giving exclusive access to the remand police officer report, he is hale and hearty as the prison authorities begin investigations into the fake reports. Inspector Ahmed Chumesi has been on remand since his arrest in May 2023 after a specialized police operation led to his arrest in his hideout at Setre near Efijasi in the Ashanti region. He has been accused of shooting 26-year-old Victoria Dapa, also known as Majwa, multiple times in the abdomen and chest on April 20, 2023, at about 9.50 p.m., though he is expected to appear before a Kumasi High Court on April 15, 2024. Rumors about his death spread on social media. The authorities of Kumasi Central Prisons granted me access to the cells of the accused. Sporting a white T-shirt over a pair of khaki shorts and slippers, he responded to questions from prison officers. He was healed and healthy. Inspector Ahmed Chumesi told the officers in my presence that he was privy to rumors of his death. Here is the public relations officer of the Kumasi Central Prisons, Superintendent Richard Bukari. Categorically not true. I emphatically say it is not true. 
Amechumesi is hale and hearty in custody. Nothing has happened to him and I promise nothing will happen to him. Uh, I took the pain to walk yourself through the prison to have a look at him. And looking at him, he's not even sick. And I wonder under what circumstances Chumasi will be declared uh, dead. Even for natural causes, we don't pray for it. But as professional as the prisons have been, uh, taking note that he's a state property, we will not do anything that will compromise his health, his security, and his well-being in the prisons. So I say on authority that Chumasi is not dead, he's alive, healthy, and undergoing his trial processes. Appalled by the circulation of the fake news, prison authorities have launched investigations to get to the bottom of the issue and punish the culprits. Superintendent Bukhari again. Anybody involved in circulating such information should be very careful. After all, it is even against the laws of the state to circulate false information. It is a chargeable offense and you can be imprisoned for it. But we are not leaving it just there. We are going further to investigate the source of that info. Whoever would have generated such false information that is causing this upheaval in the general public will have to be dealt with according to the laws of Ghana. He's just not denting the image of the prison service, but he's creating unnecessary fear and panic in the nation, which is not too good for our development, considering how far we have come. The prisons all this while has been very professional in handling uh, issues of public interest of this nature. And we promise that we aren't going to compromise on our standards. Meanwhile, Inspector Chumasi is expected to appear at the Kumase High Court on April 15, 2024. From Kumase, for Joy News, Ohim Interior reporting. Now, the scholarship secretariat is fighting off claims. It awarded scholarship to politically connected and um, persons with high societal connections, insisting that the beneficiaries were Ghanaians and have gained admissions uh, to accredited universities. The scholarship secretariat's response to the RTI request showed that it had spent 237.5 million cities and 200 million cities in 2019 and 2020, respectively, covering both foreign and local scholarships. The secretariat had come under public scrutiny in the past for often overlooking deserving applicants in favor of those with political and high society connections. Now, let's go on the lines. Now, I speak to the lead investigator on this beat at the fourth estate, Seth Bokpe. Uh, grateful to you, Seth, for joining us here. First, run us through the individuals who benefited from the scholarship secretariat within the period under review. Seth, uh, I want to find out from you, uh, uh, I mean, who are these individuals that you, know, you got uh, uh, to have been, for people uh, who benefited from the scholarship secretariat between 2019 and 2020? That's the period under your investigation. Okay, I guess uh, we would we'll still have Seth. Seth is with the uh, fourth estate. They are the body that investigated the scholarship secretariat and have come to realize that they spent between 100, over 190 uh, to 200 million dollars between 2020, uh, 2019 and 2020. And uh, the investigations also revealed that a lot more people who had connection uh, to political people or uh, people of political influence and high uh, society connections were given scholarships than people who were needy. Uh, let's go back and speak to Seth Bokpe, who is the lead on this investigation first run us through the individuals who benefited from the scholarship secretariat within the period under the review. Right. Um, hi, thank you for having me. Um, we have at least 20 names so far. Um, so there is Fauzi Ramadan, a relative to the second lady, Samira Baumia. Um, there is Lucy Blay, a caliber, who is a daughter of 
former chairman of the MPP and the GMP board chairman, and Gifty Owari Mensa, who used to be Gifty Owari Opachi, who is the deputy director of the National Service Secretariat. Okay. We have uh, Adum Efadate, a son of Captain Efadate. Efadate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, MPP member. We have Amma Fempoma Juma, Managing Director, SIT. We have Dr. Dennis Ado, who is the Founder and Chief Executive of the Claron Hospital at the Air Force Residential Area in Accra. Mm -hmm. We have Charles Asma, um, the Treasurer of the MPP UK branch. We have um, Julius Ochri, a constituency secretary in the Bwakwa South, the very constituency that the registrar comes from. Mm -hmm. We have the Ashanti Regional Youth Organizer, Raphael Patrick Sapo. Um, we have Celestine Amwakwanta. Um, she's an MPP youth activist and very um, loud on Facebook. There is Nana Poku Prefer, an aide to the Ashanti Regional Chairman. We have Nana Ibibia Asante Apiritu, um, a daughter of the former IDP, okay. um, Mr. David Asante Apiritu. We have Araba Chumisi Mensa, um, a daughter of Joe Mensa, a former MP for Kwesi Maintain in the Western region. We have a lawyer, Christine Okusuan Pedu, who had... Um, some money to go and do internship at the ICT. We have Michael Koryata, uh, personal assistant to Gabi Ochidako, and obviously related to the president, mm -hmm. and um, former finance minister Ken Ophoriata. Mm. We have Zina Asante, who is the daughter of the CEO of the National Film Authority, Juliet Asante. Okay, okay. Yeah. Are these the only people who benefited from the scholarship within the period, or these are people with Absolutely high connections? Absolutely not. There are okay. a lot more people. Okay. But these are names we were able to fish out. Mm. 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 We will indeed publish the full list later. Okay. And we are willing to update it. We are hoping to update it as the public helps us fish. Okay. Um, anybody they think is a, you know, a politically exposed person. Okay. Okay. Our uh, concern is that this, this is a scholarship that is meant for the needy, and it should be so. Okay. Uh, what, what, needy and it should be so. what has been their responses when you contacted some of these individuals for a reaction? So um, when we called Fauzi Ramadan, for instance, mm. he said that, yes, he was awarded a scholarship, but he did not go to the school. He didn't attend school because at the time it was COVID. Um, he had a few online sessions and he, had, he was involved in an accident. So he didn't continue and he didn't defer the cause at all. Um, we spoke to um, a second. We spoke to We spoke to, um, mm. what's the name? Uh, the NSS gives you our party. Okay. He initially denied it that, you know, she, her name is Gifty Owari Mensa, not Abwaji. Mm. So all we had was wrong. She will get in touch later. Okay. We called subsequently, um, we didn't get anything out of mm. her. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Very, very interesting. We said, mm -hmm. For instance, in the case of the child in the UK, he said that yes, in the UK, but he has, you know, traveling between the two countries, and he confirmed. Okay, interesting. Well, we'll keep an eye on this developing story. Grateful to you for sharing with us these details. But my colleague yeah. Carlos Caloni has been speaking with the Registrar of the Scholarship Secretariat, Dr. Kinsley Ajiman. According to him, applications are not assessed based on political cuts of potential beneficiaries. First place, who do they even identify as uh, political connectors of our party? So it's the data that you have put out there. We need to interrogate the data. 
unfortunately, when they met me, they didn't approach me with this data. If they think they had a strong data analysis, by the way of the analysis, when this is purely academic exercise, data needs to be interrogated. I'm a data person. Okay. So they should have brought this thing up. They had the data set that they have slept with it for over three years. And this is a kind of analysis. So the, the I'm coming at, this is out of how many? Is it statistically significant? It's not. We are uh, also learning that an MPP constituency is a Don't worry, don't, don't get it. Don't, 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 was, don't. Let, let, let me just learn on this. Was awarded multiple scholarships for master's program, totaling about uh, 57,210 uh, pounds sterling. So what, what do they mean by multiple scholarships? They have to define their variables. Is, is because I had, I, had, I had, no, I had this discussion with them and I explained to them, we, we are running academic years. So if somebody had, let's say, a scholarship in 2019-2020 and had a, conserva a consecutive one of 2020 and 2021 to complete a skill development program, is that multiple? So we need to understand what they meant by multiple uh, scholarship. So this outliers that we have picked, significance. You can only throw out political mischief <laughs> because we don't ask for your party card in our assessment of a scholarship. How about maybe the other side who have also benefited from scholarship, if any? But you choose and pick this few out of a huge data that was given to you. For me, I think the, the object may not be too appropriate. Well, that's still the joy news prime. Now, uh, we'll take a quick break. When we return, we have more news for you. Please do stay. Welcome back from the break. Uh, let's do some election-related uh, stories. And we remember the election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosolio Clean Fuel in Full Quantity, Chartered Institute of uh, uh, Management Accountant, and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountant, together as the Association of International Certified Professional Accountant and the German Ozone Medical Center, Alternative Therapy, Dental Wellness and Beauty. Election headquarters for an informed electorate. Now, there is a strong push from the Ghana Judicial Service for some amendment to be made to the legal instrument governing parliamentary elections petitions in the country. This proposal targets reducing the number of days spent in adjudicating such cases. Currently, a petitioner has by law 21 days to file a case on any parliamentary election outcome from the day of declaration of results. However, the Election Management Committee of the Judicial Service says this provision is putting more pressure on the courts and must be repealed or amended. There is more in this report by Samuel Imbura. If this proposal by the Judiciary Service Election Management Committee goes through, it will mean any petitioner going forward in any parliamentary election will have only seven days from the day of declaration of results to file a case. His Lordship Justice Bafoboni, Chairman of the Judiciary Election Management Committee, says this will save cost and time at the courts. We are proposing that the PNDC law 284, section 26, should be repealed and or amended, and then it may be a new law altogether governing parliamentary elections. It's, I mean, procedure is set out completely in a new law. CI 47 provides that appearance shall be filed within eight days and defense filed within 14 days. So a respondent seeking to delay the process actually has 22 days within which to file a response. This is too long. In reaction to this proposal, some political parties are kicking strongly against it. I'm still um, up to the 21 days. I strongly believe that the 21 days is what we need. I mean, putting up a very solid petition requires and entails a lot of diligent work. You just don't want to put anything there and then use amendment to beef it up. No. 
If you are going, you are going. If you are not going, you are not going. Seven days uh, is a bit too short if you ask me. Because for those of us who have been doing this thing for, for a while, yes, people think that it is just easy to put stuff together to contest an election petition. But you should take into consideration that this is an election which has been fought and won by a particular candidate. And you want to reverse that decision. Seven days is just too short, in my candid opinion, to be able to file a petition, taking the dynamics and the issues that are involved holistically. Seven days is a bit too short. Introducing new evidence on appeal is a very um, um, tough hurdle. It, it is only in a minority of cases that it is allowed. But in this law, that can be relaxed a bit, that in election petitions, such um, fraudulent activities on opponents can be brought even after the seven days has lapsed. But the Electoral Commission has assured that the bottlenecks will be addressed. Dr. Bosman Asari is Deputy Director in charge of corporate services at the EC. Of the constituency declares is final. That's why when you have any issue with it, we at the head office cannot even alter it unless you use the legal process. So it's final. Those people have been given the right from the chairperson to conduct the elections in that particular constituency. So once they declare it's final in that constituency, they only announce the presidential results in that constituency. But for the parliamentary, by law, they declare the winner. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the National Peace Council, which is the arbiter in this consensus building engagement with the political parties, is optimistic the new proposal will mitigate any eventuality from the upcoming election. Dr. Enes Edujemfi is chairman of the National Peace Council. I think, uh, like they've already indicated, for every election they do a publication, and their next publication is coming out in about August. And so they will incorporate most of these things that we have discussed here into that publication and make them available. As they've said, it's, it's free, so anybody can obtain a copy and they uh, know what exactly is happening in terms of how election adjudication processes are going. The time frame for parliamentary petition cases in the proposal by the Judicial Service has been pegged at 15 weeks for adjudication. There was no emphasis on presidential election petition because the Judicial Service says the provision on that is entrenched. Samuel Mbura, Joy News. Now, he dreams of becoming a medical doctor, but finds himself unable to afford further education just as he began to navigate his setback by working as a waiter. A serious medical condition, brain tumor, hit him. That is the story of 20-year-old Daniel Okoti, who is racing against time to undergo surgery to correct the anomaly. He's asking for help to get the surgery done. Here's Zuleha Nuhu's report right to you. Meet Daniel Odwe Okuti, a once active 20-year-old who has been diagnosed with a brain tumor resulting in a large lesion occupying space in his brain. This condition has made it difficult for Daniel to control his movements, forcing him to quit his job. His mother, Nancy Dako, spoke to Joy News about how his condition is affecting them financially and emotionally. So with his situation has really put me down. It has not been easy. I've been crying all night. I've been having sleepless nights. Even sometimes when I'm at work and then I remember whatever is happening to us now, I have to cry for the kids even have to come closer to me and say, why, Aunt Nancy, stop crying. What is wrong with you? We can't afford to lose him. So I am pleading with everyone out there, with all due respect. I know this little boy will touch your heart. He's just 20 years of age and he's the only son I have now. So I am pleading with everyone out there that you help me save my son's life, my only son's life. He means a lot to me and I beg everyone out there, without your help, he can't make it. I am pleading with everyone. Nothing is too small for us. Everything that comes from your heart will be much grateful. A neurosurgeon and consultant at the International Maritime Hospital, Dr. Jimmy Abubakar, is urging the public to assist Daniel to undergo surgery 
which cost 10,071 Ghana cities so he can reclaim his life. Daniel shared with Joy News how his condition is impacting his family, especially his mother. So when I was told I had brain tumor, I felt surprised and I thought that's all. But the doctor told me something that I should just stay bold and be strong, but everything will be fine. So that kept me very okay from that time. What has really changed is my balance. Because first I could run, I could walk fast, I could do everything, I could play football and everything. But for now, when I'm walking, I feel like the world is going around. My dream of becoming a medical doctor is very meaningful to me so that I can also help people or the sick so that they too, they can also be on their feet. My family is not stable because my mom is a preschool teacher and my dad is a carpenter and both of them don't really have that financial support to cater for me to or to do my surgery. I'm pleading to the public to help me donate so that I could have my surgery and also come back to my normal position as I was at first and also so that I shouldn't lose my life because it's very something very serious that if care is not taken I might lose my life. I want um, people to help me so that the surgery can be done so that their stress and their emotions and everything ends because my family or my mom and my sisters are going through a lot with stress. Time is of the essence for Daniel Odoe Okoti. Without the surgery, he faces the risk of blindness, complete loss of movement, severe headaches and possibly death. Doctors, Daniel and his mother, are making a heartfelt appeal to the general public for assistance. Zuleha Nuhu's report read to you. Well, that's a story of a young man who wants to become a medical doctor. But he needs your help to be able to realize that, that uh, future. Your little support can go uh, to do, do a lot more for him. So kindly support this young man to get his life back on track. Well, this is still the journey's prime. We'll take a quick break here. We'll be back with Showbiz. Do stay.